Hey everybody, it's Delta Shiny Zeta here, and today we're going to learn how to play the 2 to 5 player game designed by Adam Wick, Galatune. So this game here is a very interesting game, it's one of the newer ones, and I'm going to be actually using the Dawn of Borrow Light starter deck to demonstrate on how to play this game. As I just said, it's 2 to 5 players recommended for ages 14 and up, and time length takes 20 plus minutes. It takes even longer if you choose to lengthen the victory condition, which I'll get into in just a little bit. You can find a lot of information on Galatune.com as well, but as far as how to play, you are in the right place. So upon opening this particular product, you're going to see a couple things. The very first thing is that you'll see a game manual, which if you, if you already know the game or if you're watching this video, you don't really need to use this. Aside from the very back part of it, because this back part actually does show you some very important information, which I'll talk about later. There's also going to be two different types of counters. One of these counters are the health counters or HP counters, and the others are the uh, victory counters as well. So you have two types of those. And then lastly, you have two types of cards. The very first types of cards are going to be the character cards. So there's actually several of them, but nowhere near as many as the action cards, which are down there. All of these character cards are foil in the front, and on the back side they're non-foil, but the back side is actually more important for the actual gameplay. And the final type of card is going to be the action card, which uh, there's actually plenty of in here in this particular starter deck. So I'm going to go ahead and take that out, and now I can go ahead and set the box aside. In terms of setting up the game, it's going to depend on how many players are playing the game. Like I kept saying, the game is 2-5 to five players, so each player is going to be able to start by selecting one of these character cards. There are plenty of them and there's enough for everyone because you're only choosing one each. Each character card does have a lot of differences and I'll be covering all these one at a time right now as a quick introduction to how to actually read a character card. So the first thing you'll actually notice is that there's two icons in the top corners and you can actually use the back of the game manual as a quick reference for this. But the top left corner is actually the alignment of the character, and the top right corner is the element. So as you can see, this particular character card, Princess Violetta Crown, is actually of the war element, but also of the light alignment. You can see right here, light alignment and war element. These are the two that actually end up matching the character. By quickly looking at this, you can see that there are four different elements. There is Nature, War, Mystic, and Technology, Tech for short, and then there's three different alignments. There's Light, Dark, and Unaligned. Going back to the character card, in the bottom right corner and the bottom left corner, we see two additional numbers. There's a black star, these are the character's action points, and then there's a red heart, these are the character's health points. So that's it for the front of the card, but the back of the card has a couple more things. First of all, when you're playing the game, uh, it's highly recommended that you go ahead and actually play with this side up. Even though there's less art, of course, it's recommended to because first of all, this side actually still shows everything that you need to play the game that can be found on the front side. The front side has these four things for the gameplay, and the back side has the same four things, but the back side also has a couple of things here in the middle. Now this particular section, this paragraph that each character actually has at the bottom of this rather faded line, is uh, not relevant at all to the gameplay. It's more so for lore and story purposes if you want to get to know the lore of Galatune, so I'm not going to be covering this massive chunk of a paragraph down here. The two that are relevant though are these two portions right here, and you can actually see typically two different names, either in red or in blue. Let me go ahead and pull up another one to see an example of a blue one. These are a character's special actions or special abilities. A special action is in red and a special ability is in blue. Basically, a special action can be used during the game instead of using an action card, which I'll explain a little bit later on what that means. But a blue one, which is a special ability, these are actually passive abilities. So you do not activate them, but they're just passive abilities that a character has. Now, even though I haven't yet explained what they're actually for, it's because I actually have to go ahead and dive into the game. So for this how to play video, I'm going to be demonstrating a three player game. So I'm just going to be choosing, let's just say the top three. But there's a lot more cards available, as you can see, plenty more cards. I'll just quickly show these. And the characters do vary a lot in terms of their abilities that you can find on the back side, as well as their action points and health points. So once you know the game very well, choose wisely. So I'm going to be moving the rest of these character cards over onto the side of the box. They're not going to be used for a while. They can eventually be used later in the game, but for the meantime, just to make more space, I'm going to remove them. So let's just assume that this is the first player, second player, and the third player. Now normally in an actual circumstance there'd be a lot more space and each character would probably be facing each other of course on the table, but because I'm a little bit combined in space, 
Let's just show them all like this. That way I don't do things upside down and then you can't see. So let's just assume each play area, you know, belongs to one player. As I mentioned before, it's highly recommended to go ahead and flip the cards over. That way you actually know the different abilities that each character has. Even though there's less artwork and I get that you may want to flip it to the other side, that's up to you if you want to, but just know you are constantly going to have to be flipping it back and forth throughout the game. The next thing you want to do is we're going to go ahead and be using these uh, different uh, counters for health. They're called HP counters. To set this up correctly, all we're basically doing is looking at each character card and putting an amount of counters on the character equal to the amount of health that they actually have. Now, I know what you may be thinking. You may be thinking to only place them once they actually start taking damage instead of putting them all and then removing them. The problem with that is that there's no limit to HP. So a character could technically go above this amount. And so if that happens, it's very difficult to actually do that. Because let's say this character has nine, but then gains two more HP. What are you going to do? Are you going to place two more counters? That's going to get very confusing because you're also placing counters when they take damage. So it's recommended to go ahead and place counters on them equal to the number. And then if they get more HP, you go above and beyond. And if they lose HP, you then remove counters. All right, so I went ahead and placed counters right above each of these different characters. So the first one is nine, the second one is six, and the third one is seven. I recommend placing them nearby the card and not actually on top because then you end up blocking some words and text that you actually want to make sure that you are reading, you know, uh, as you're playing the game. So I'm just going to put them right on top. Now we're going to go ahead and shuffle these cards. So I'll shuffle them right now. Next, we're going to deal cards equal to the number of action points that the character has to each player. For example, this middle one, Jay Skyrunner, has 13 action points. This one over here is going to get 12. As you can see, this one's a 12 and 9 ratio. And then the last one over here is an 11 and 7. So you're going to get 11. So let me go ahead and deal these cards out face down. All right, I went ahead and deal the cards. I can just set these right over here as well. That works too. I guess I'll just put them sideways. And now every player can actually look at the cards in their hand. But a really nice twist about this game is that before cards are officially in the hand, every player is entitled to look at all cards at all points in this game whenever they're drawn. So whenever we draw a card, Everyone else can take a look at the card and then it gets added into the hand officially of that player. Once the card is officially in the hand, then it can no longer be seen by other players. And that right there is the overall setup of the game. As far as the goal, the goal is actually to make other character cards actually fall in battle by depleting their health points all the way through. When a character falls, the person that actually depleted the health points of that character actually gets one victory point. And that is, once again, showcased by these yellow counters. The first player to gain three victory points ends up winning the game. The game is played in a series of four different phases per round. I'm not going to read all this, but I just want to show you the four titles. There's the plan phase, the action phase, the trap phase, and the resolve phase. So during the plan phase, every single player is going to be taking a look at all the action cards that they have in their hand. So let me go ahead and give an overview of action cards, just like how I give an overview of character cards. So the first thing you'll notice is that the top half of the action card is all the artwork. Then there's the title of the card as well. Then usually there's two amounts of text. Just like the character cards, the portion underneath that slightly faded line is only for lore purposes. So you do not need to take a look at that at all if you just want to know how to play the game. However, the top section is actually the effect of what the card does. Before I get into that though, I will explain the very bottom portion of the card. The bottom left corner is the element of that particular action card. An element can be any of the four character elements or any of the three alignments as well. So yes, you will find things that are the four elements on the outer circle, but you will also find things that are in the alignment here. So for example, this one over here is light element. So it can get a little confusing, but just to clarify, character cards actually differentiate the element and the alignment, but action cards group it together. It can be either any element or any alignment in that corner. The next part is the bottom right corner. This is the action card's property. There are only two types of properties in the game, and this thing actually shows you as well. There are normal action cards and energy action cards in terms of their property. The fist-like icon is normal, and the lightning icon, when we get to one, this one is actually an energy. And the third thing at the bottom is the action card's function. The function usually has a different type of icon depending on the function of that card. The sword, for example, means attack or damage. The shield is literally a shield. That means shield. The two arrows means boost. There's also a heart function. 
Heart function means life, so you're going to be able to heal your hero. There's also a circle icon. The circle icon by the game's standards and rules means other. It just means other in general. Usually these are very unique and powerful effects that are different than the typical icons that you'll see a lot of the time. And the very last one is a spiderweb-like icon, and that one means trap. A lot of these icons are very self-explanatory. For example, the damage indicated by a number means that you'll be doing that much damage to another particular character card. The shield will actually defend you from that much damage for that particular character card. The boost is able to intensify the value of whatever the effect says for that particular character card, and so on and so forth. So during the playing phase, every single player is going to be taking a look at their hand and essentially choosing one card that they're going to play. There are, however, two main rules that you have to follow in the plan phase. First is that you cannot use attack cards on your own character card. You can use attack cards on everyone else and you can use other cards, for example, like shield cards or life cards to anyone, including other characters. So yes, you can choose to defend another player's character card if you want to. More often than not, you wouldn't do that, but you can do that. So you can shield opponents, but you cannot attack yourself. The second rule is that you cannot use trap cards during the planned phase. So if you ever see anyone's with a spiderweb icon, I actually recommend to just kind of put them in the back so you don't even look at that. You can use any card with any icon, basically any function except trap cards. Let's go with the basics and just go ahead and choose this basic slingshot. It's just a simple attack. It's a very weak card. It just has one damage, but we're going to go in and choose this one. So once a player has chosen a card before they actually play it, all they have to do is say the word ready. Once all players in the game say the word ready, that means everybody is now ready to play a card and cards are going to be played simultaneously. There are no turns in this game. It's all simultaneous. Once everybody says ready, then one player is going to go ahead and count down from three. They're going to say three, two, one, go. And on go, all characters are going to go ahead and reveal the card they're playing and immediately play it on any particular character. Usually the way it would happen is every person is going to be holding the card in their hand away from all the other cards, maybe in their other hand, and then someone's going to count down. Three, two, one, and on go you're going to place the card face up on another character. You cannot wait for other characters to make their decision first. This must happen simultaneously. So for example, these are the three that are being played, but obviously it's just me by myself, but each of these would be held by another person. And on three, two, one, go. On go, everybody would then play these cards at the same time. It's a little hard for me to do this by myself, but uh, let's just assume that all this happened at the same time, right? So go happen, and then let's say that this is what happened, okay? So just to clarify, this card was played by this uh, person. This card, which I actually showed you, a little sample was played by the person in the middle which is the main person I'm actually sampling here um, and then this card was played by them over here so we had one attack card directed to the one in the middle we had one attack card directed to the one on the left and then we had a shield card self-directed to the one on the left so all of that that I just explained right now is actually the action phase the action phase is literally the part where you're counting down and when you are playing your cards and that's all it is for the action phase that's it once again, trap cards cannot be played during the action phase. You are not yet resolving any of the damage uh, during this phase. You are keeping them all face up right now because now we're moving on to the third phase, the trap phase. During this phase, players are able to play trap cards from their hand. And as a quick little reminder, these are the ones with the spiderweb icon. Trap cards usually end up blocking other cards that were played either on your character or others. But you want to make sure you take a look at the effect in terms of what they do so that maybe sometimes you can actually block an effect that's being directed at you. The key difference during this phase is that these things are not happening simultaneously. Instead, anybody can play a trap card at any point. The way that you play a trap card is that you simply go ahead and play it on the table. And once it's flat on the table, that means you officially play the trap card and you have to designate what you are actually stopping. You must then play the trap card next to that character just like how you play other action cards next to that character as well to stop something if you would like to do that. There's no limit to the amount of trap cards you can actually play. So if I play a trap card and then this player over here just has to play a trap card to then stop my trap card, which is possible, but then this person over here tries to play that trap card to stop the other trap card, and you can keep going and going and going as long as you still have trap cards available in your hand. However, once all players have finally decided that they are done playing trap cards, we then move on to the fourth and final phase, which is the resolve phase. In the resolve phase, we're going to be using the element wheel that you can find on the back of the manual to calculate the amount of damage. And this is the part that I have not mentioned yet regarding the purpose of all these things. 
If you take a look at the element wheel, you're going to see a times two indicator. Essentially, the game works on a trump system. How if you're behind the arrow, you actually trump the other element or the other uh, alignment that is in front of you. For example, any character that is a mystic element is actually going to be taking twice the damage from a war action card. Any character that is a nature element is going to be taking twice the damage from a tech element action card. The same thing works with alignment. Light always trumps dark and dark always trumps light. So that's a very interesting wheel there. And then there's unaligned in the middle that is basically unaffected in terms of times too. The other important thing with this too is that all characters are actually immune to all damage of their same element and their same alignment. For example, if we take a look at this character in particular, we can see that the character, just by looking at the top right corner, matches the nature element, which means that if this character were to ever take nature element damage from an action card or anything, then it's actually set to zero. The character is immune to that damage. The same thing happens over here. This particular one is a light alignment, which means any light damage to this card is actually set to zero because they're immune. So it's very strategic on that way. You want to be able to utilize cards from your hand that inflict twice the amount of damage to opponent's characters. And you actually want to avoid using cards that have elements that actually match the element or alignment of other characters because in the end it's useless and you'll be doing zero damage. It even indicates to you right here how it says self times zero. If it matches yourself, then it's times zero. But the last thing I want to mention is over here with the normal and energy. Once again, these are properties. So all attacks do actually have a property which you can find in the bottom right corner of the card. Properties don't really come into play as often as elements or alignments because it's really more so just for effects. For example, if we take a look at this card again, J Skyrunner, we can actually see the Feather Flight passive ability. Remember, it's blue, so it's a passive ability. And it says J avoids all harm from normal attacks with ratings of four or lower. So if we take a look at this card that was actually played, the person was actually smart because this was an energy card. If this were to have been a normal card, meaning the fist icon, then I would actually be taking zero damage because this literally says from normal attacks. But this is an energy property card and see the card would have been four or less, which means that he would have been able to avoid it if it was a normal attack. But unfortunately it's not. So let's go ahead and calculate this turn to see how it played out. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with this one once again. So this is Jay Skyrunner who was actually directed by an attack from this Dark Star card. And this says, if this attack causes the target to fall, the user wins three additional action cards. I'll talk about falling later, but the truth is we did not fall because this is actually two damage, as you can see right there. But in terms of the element, if you're not sure what it is, just go ahead and, you know, take this out and it says dark, which is very interesting because dark versus light is actually times two. So what does this mean? This means that the damage is actually doubled because by taking a look at this thing once again, Dark does twice the damage to light, just like how light does twice the damage to dark. Which means that this is 2 times 2. And as a quick reminder, it's energy, so that means that the passive ability of J does not work because it only protects you from normal attacks of 4 or lower. So in the end, this means that J ended up taking 4 damage this turn. Its effect does not work because we did not actually fall the character with this attack. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove 4 of these counters. So here we have 2, I'm going to put 3. Four, and there's actually two left here because as a reminder, this thing has six HP and you already lost four, which means that you're only down to two health left for this character. If we take a look at what happened over here, the truth is nothing happened. This character was not targeted by anything, so we can just avoid that. But if we take a look at this side over here, a couple things happen. So the very first thing, it's a slingshot, it's a simple attack, only one damage, and it's actually war in terms of the element. If you take a look at this uh, right here, war up at the very top. So if we then take a look at this character here, we can see that it's actually war. So that was not a smart play though by the person in the middle. They may have forgotten that war was actually this character's element. This means that they would be immune to all damage from this particular attack because it matches their element. However, let's take a look at this card here. This player actually ended up playing a shield. As you can see, it's 15. And it says Angel Wing. It says if this shield doesn't break on this turn, the target gains 4 HP. Did the shield break? No. Even if the attack went through, that would have only been 1 to 15. So it would have been 14 defense left. So yes, I guess you're wondering, this is actually one of the best shields in the game. And this is one of the worst attacks in the game. So it's a great combination there, right? But yes, yeah, so that's a very strong card, very weak card. So the shield did not break, which means that this character actually gains 4 HP this turn. So we're going to go back to the box in the bag and we're going to get these 4 uh, counters here and we're going to go ahead and give them to this character. 
And yes, as I mentioned before, you can go above your limit for the character's HP. After that, all cards that were played on each particular character are then going to be grouped together and placed face up in the used pile section. Basically, every single character has a used pile section next to them. So what you want to do, and again, this is going to be a little bit difficult because I'm confined in space, but you essentially put the card face up next to your character. Don't make it be touching that character. A great way to actually distinguish that is if a card is touching a character, it means that it was actually played to them that turn. But if you just put it face up near them in a use pile section there, then you can actually see that the card is simply the use pile section next to that character. And that's essentially the basics of Galatune. The use pile section keeps staying face up there, which means that you don't have the option to play that card anymore because it's no longer in your hand for the following round. You keep playing cards every single round until you can make other characters fall. Now, when a character falls, a couple interesting things happen. First is that any player who landed an attack towards the character that made them fall ends up gaining one victory counter, which is one of these. The second thing that a player gets rewarded with if they went ahead and made another character fall is that they get to look at the hand of that particular player. So let's assume that this character ended up falling. I got hit by, let's say, both of these. They both use an attack on me, and I ended up falling because I only had 2 HP. So I'll go ahead and remove these. My character has fallen. Then each of these players gets to look at my hand, and they get to actually take 5 cards from the hand and add it into their hand. As a quick heads up, if more than one player ended up knocking out a character and made them fall at the same time, then the player who did the most damage gets to look at the hand first. If there's a tie of damage, to be honest, the game rules don't really mention that. For example, if this character did 4 damage and this character did 4 damage, we tied, but there's no way to distinguish who actually gets to do this first. In this case, I suggest maybe rolling a dice or flipping a coin, doing something that's random. Let's assume that this player did more damage, so what this player gets to do is they get to take a look at the entire hand, and they get to either take 5 cards, or if they don't like any of these, they get to take 5 cards from the top of the deck and add it into their hand. Let's say this player did not like any of these, so they're actually going to be taking 5 cards from the top of the deck. 4 and 5. As a reminder, you must take either 5 or there. You cannot take like 3 from here and then 2 from over there for a total of 5. That's not how that works. Now let's go ahead and give it to this player because this player also did some damage, but they were in second place with the amount of damage. And you know, this player, let's say they just like, uh, let's say they like these 5. So they get to take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, these 5 different cards, and they get to add them into their hand. This is actually the hand of that player right there. I know it's a little bit messy, but there we go. So after they each earn one victory point, which I'm going to place right there with a the yellow indicator, then what we do next is up to the player that ended up having their character fall, because they get two options. The first option is that they get to reuse that same character card again. If they choose to stay with that character, then what we're going to do is we're going to search for the amount of counters equal to that character's HP once again, and essentially reset them. So we're going to fill the HP of that character back up to the top, and that's how that works. The other option, however, is instead of doing that, they can actually take a look at the entire pile of all the different character cards, which are right over here. And this is what I was mentioning earlier, that you may end up using these later in the game. So let's say this player was actually, you know what, I'm not feeling this guy anymore, I'm going to put him back. So they get to actually take a look at all of these and choose a new one instead. Let's say they decide to choose this one. This one has 7 action points and 15 hearts. So there we go, they're going to choose that one. And like always, we're going to begin encounters to equal the amount of health points that that character has. Yes, these are 15 of them because this particular character has a lot of HP. However, let's go back to J instead. So it's 13 and 6. So now the very next thing that's going to happen is that that player is then going to be able to draw cards from the deck up until they equal the number of action points. And if you remember, this one's actually at 13. How many do they have now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Which means they get to actually draw 6 cards. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And there we go. Now they have 13 cards once again, and now play proceeds. A new round starts. However, let's go back to the original seven cards instead. So I went ahead and put those six back because the other option, the second option that they get, is that they get to actually get a completely new hand instead. Essentially, the way this works is that you shuffle all the cards into your hand, into the deck, you shuffle the entire deck again, and then you draw your 13 cards in this case. However, if instead you choose to take a new character card, such as this one, for example, you actually have to get rid of your entire current hand, shuffle them, and then draw the new amount. So you do not get the option of just simply drawing up to the new action points if you choose a new character card. The only other thing I want to mention is that characters also instead have this red ability. I talked about the blue one, which is passive. 
that's just something you need to read and then you have to you know just remember that that passability is on but the other one which is the red one is another actual action what you can do on your turn is instead of playing an action card from your hand on that on that action phase instead of that you can actually go ahead and declare that you're using this and then you have to choose the character immediately it's a little tricky to pull it off by doing it really fast but you kind of just get used to that rhythm and just like action cards all these different abilities also have an element and a property so it's important to follow this when you're calculating damage towards other characters other than that though that's actually it for the entire game it's honestly pretty fun it does have somewhat of a steep learning curve if you want to get more into the actual core of the game and some complicated things but overall it's very very fun highly recommend and as a reminder you don't have to play until three victory points if you actually want to lengthen the game you can agree before you play the game to instead maybe do five victory points or so on and so forth but three victory points is recommended especially for beginners other than that i'm all done with this video hopefully this video did help you out as always don't forget to leave a like comment subscribe and turn on notifications if you enjoyed the video bye bye everyone see you all next time have a great day